And now let's look at this plot. So here is a plot. This is now quiescence of a whole lot of X-ray binaries. All of them, you go look at their luminosity. This was the fourth panel, incidentally, in the previous one, the 2007 panel. So you look at the quiescent luminosity in Eddington units, and it's plotted here against the orbital period of the binary. So this was a kind of an advance that came after our first paper. This was an advance introduced by Lasota and Amuri, Menu et al., and then explained in other papers, where basically just using ordinary binary physics and mass transfer physics, you can show that neutron stars and black holes, in fact, independent of mass more or less, the mass transfer rate would be roughly the same for both objects at a given orbital period. So that's the reason for plotting it as a function of orbital period. We may not know how to calculate m dot, but we feel that the m dot of these systems should be the same as those, provided you compare them at the same value of orbital period. Clearly there is, you know, the luminosity is showing a trend with orbital period, and that is to be expected. These models actually tell you that it should go like this. As I said, the normalization is hard to figure out. But in any case, once you plot it like this, we believe you are justified in comparing in the vertical direction any pair of objects. And what you see is very nicely that uh, I've just drawn these red lines to help you in case you didn't get the message. Right? So that's the mean of all the neutron stars. That's the mean of all the black holes. When you do it in this Eddington units, which is, we think, the correct way to do it, you get, is it two and a half orders of magnitude? Yeah. Factor of 300 difference in the mean. If you say, I don't like Eddington, I just want to look at the Ergs per second itself, you can do that. Of course, because the black holes are more massive, you know, the normalization is slightly different. You still get your two orders of magnitude. It's not a small effect, okay? It's not a small effect. Plotted in this way, there's absolutely no overlap between the neutron stars and black holes, and the mean trends are so completely different. There are one or two neutron stars that may be a little dimmer than this. In fact, Andy was reminding me of this system, 1905. I looked at the paper. Its luminosity seems to be just marginally less than this guy, but we don't know what its orbital period is. So, you know, somebody should go and measure the orbital period. If it turns out to be, you know, 20 hours and it sits here, we would be in an embarrassing situation. But I would predict, and I'm sure our co-authors will agree, we think this period is going to be too hot one and a half hours, and you know, it'll probably be exactly in this band. But this is to be seen. These are all the systems. You know, there's, there's no data selection here. It's every system for which we have the luminosities and we have the orbital periods. Okay, so that's the first test, which has just come along and become really good. This is a minor addition to that test, which is to say, look, that was just looking at the luminosity. What about the spectrum? What kind of spectrum do we expect from the surface? And I think we can all agree that the spectrum is likely to be mostly thermal. I mean, it's a very optically thick object. You're dumping a lot of energy. It's going to re-radiate. So, you know, as a good first approximation, we think it's going to be a thermal kind of spectrum with some spectral hardening, like what Jeff described. So then you can say, let's go and see whether any of our guys have something like a, spect a thermal component in their spectrum. The fact of the matter is, if you look at all of our black hole systems, all of these detections, they are all consistent with power loss spectrum. In fact, they're consistent with pure power loss. There's nothing needed in addition to that. But you can ask, maybe we didn't look hard enough, could there be an additional thermal somewhere sitting which we haven't yet really fitted with our data? And the best system in which you can look for this additional component happens to be XTE J1118 because this has a very low column. It has such a low column that you can go to very, very soft X-rays and you can detect even a very soft thermal component if it were there. And what McClintock et al. did is to show that there is a clean, firm upper limit to how much emission could be coming in a thermal component in addition to the power law component. Bottom line is it's much too low. It is not consistent with what you would expect if all of this stuff was hitting a surface and coming out as thermal radiation. So at least in this one system, we can say there is no hidden thermal component in, in a band that we could not observe. We can observe over all the interesting bands in this case, and we can tell that there is no soft thermal X-ray component. Now, this, this argument, I, I want to talk about Sagittarius A star, because you know, we started with Sagittarius A star, with Reinhard Genzel, and you know, we keep talking about this guy. You all know the facts. It's a very, very dim black hole center of our galaxy. It's got a luminosity of 10 to the 36 ergs per second. 
It's got a black hole mass of 4 million solar masses. This emission, which is coming in the submillimeter, has a brightness temperature greater than 10 to the 10 Kelvin, which you can do by VLBA. Right? You know the size, you know the flux. Extremely bright, so it's an extremely high temperature radiation with, of course, very low flux. Very, very, very optically thin kind of emission. That's really what it's saying. It is not the normal thermal emission that you might expect from a surface. This stuff is clearly coming from the accretion disk. Accretion disk, jet, I don't care what it is, but it is some optically thin gas floating around on the outside. Now, my question is, okay, when this gas finally comes to the center, if Sagittarius A star had a surface, what would it do? It's going to radiate. You know, this hot gas, when it hits the center, is going to then thermalize, and then it's going to radiate. The question is, where is that radiation? We have a lot of uh, you know, data on the spectrum. This is where all the energy is coming, submillimeter. Of course, we don't know what's coming out in the optical and UV because of all the obscuration. Then we know something about what the X-rays are doing and the gamma rays. There's really no evidence that there's any other radiation coming up. So the question is, where would this radiation come and how much do we expect? So let me remind you numbers that, in fact, Reinhardt mentioned in his talk. The gas supply to the galactic center, if you went to, say, 10 parsecs or 20 parsecs, is very large, 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 4 solar masses per year. By the time you come to the Bondi radius and use Chandra data, this is your estimate, 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus 6 solar masses per year. By the time you come closer to the black hole and use your radio Faraday observations, Maroni et al., you're getting even lower, 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8 solar masses per year. That's still actually quite a substantial accretion rate because this would correspond to a luminosity of 10 to the 39 arcs per second, which this guy is not radiating. It's only 10 to the 36. So let's just throw all this out of the window and say, look, this guy is producing 10 to the 36 arcs per second. There's got to be a minimum accretion rate just to produce that luminosity. That's about 10 to the minus 10 solar masses per year. It cannot possibly accrete less than this because if it did, what is powering the submillimeter radiation? Okay? So let's say even though this is you know, ridiculous, we would call this a low accretion rate even for an X-ray binary, but let's just concede that this is the accretion rate on Sagittarius A star. What will it do? It will produce infrared radiation, 10 to the 36 arcs per second of it, and it will come out in the infrared band. That's the good thing. If it came out in the UV band, we would have to throw up our hands. But it turns out for the parameters of Sag A star, you can show that it will come out in the infrared band. It's, it's the same calculation that Jeff showed. L goes as 4 pi r squared sigma t to the 4. I just noticed. So 10 to the 36 arcs per second is what we expect from the surface. And the actual observations, as you know, we have this beautiful uh, uh, AO observations of the center, and people have actual infrared observations. The observations are all a factor of 100 below this. So this was actually the argument that Avery Broderick and I made in a couple of papers last year and this year. Essentially, you know, forget all the axes. This is what at least this much infrared emission was expected, and what you actually see is about two, two and a half orders below. So I think the galactic center is really a very, very powerful argument because this is the one case where I think we know what is the M dot, or at least we have a limit on the M dot, and that limit is completely inconsistent with the expected surface emission. Okay, so now let's look at some of the other methods, right? So let's go back to the disks, which are not advection dominated, but are actually radiatively efficient. So this is back to the high soft state. You get, as I said, 0.1 m dot c squared from the disk and maybe some equivalent amount from the surface. We cannot look at the luminosity itself and say anything because it's only a factor of two difference. However, as I mentioned at the beginning, this second component, we hope, or we expect, will have different properties from this component. So what we expect is that when we look at black holes, there will be only this one guy, this uh, thermal emission from the disk in the emission. And when we look at the neutron star systems, there should be a sum of two and this component will have different properties. It will be different in its spectral properties. It will be different in its variability properties. So this is now a, a more qualitative argument. We are not doing anything quantitative at this point because for quantitative, eight halves are much better. You can get factors of 100 and 1,000. Here, we are just looking for something, some difference in the spectrum. 
So this is a very nice argument by Chris Doan and Marek Gerlinski, where they just said, let's go and look at all the bright soft state data of neutron star X-ray binaries and black hole X-ray binaries. And they are, actually, they decided to plot it in a color-color diagram. This is a soft color and a hard color. I think the soft color is a color in the few keV range, and this guy is kind of in the 10 keV range. Doesn't matter. All the black dots here are black hole system observations. So what they do is each black hole system, they look at all of the data. Anytime it gets into this, this thermal dominant state, they extract its color, and they put a dot. And of course, each source gives you many, many dots because it's been observed for such a long time. So they, I don't know, maybe, maybe there are half a dozen sources here, but each source has got obviously 100 measurements or whatever. So all the black dots are the black hole systems, and the red dots here are the neutron star systems. 